G'day fans and welcome to our first ever episode where we review The Mandalorian. How exciting is this? This is Dags and MPS with you and tonight we're actually going to be reviewing the episode The Marshal. First episode of season two. How exciting is that? MPS, very quickly, what are your thoughts, mate? Oh, i got to say it was good to see the Mando back and there was a couple of things I thought, well, I saw that coming and I didn't see that coming and I thought, well, I saw that coming as well. So, uh, but we'll get into those a little later. Very much so. I think the first thing is that um, for Star Wars fans, like there's been such a long drought between the last season and this season, they've been hanging out for this thing. We get to go back to Tatooine, we get to see some Tusken Raiders, oh. we even get to see some Massifs, which is the Tusken Raiders dogs, and it's all very groovy, and the thing with a crate dragon, and of course we'll talk about the big cheese himself <laughs> right at the very, very end. Oh my God, <laughs> didn't that one just like set the world absolutely on fire? So there we go. Um, so I found it interesting, like at the very start, you go to that unknown town, and we go and see the Cyclops dude, and it's all very, very exciting and i realized afterwards i like you know you got you know, the gamorian guards having a bit of a bash up in the in the ring and i thought they're actually using ropes around it's like a like a 20th century like earth yeah. boxing ring i thought they don't have laser beams or anything like <laughs> it's a bit of a cheap way of doing it, isn't it? <laughs> i gotta say that i thought that and i've got to say i was disappointed in some aspects of this episode that fight scene at the start with those two gamorians was just lackluster there was no energy the vibro blades, were, vibro blades were pretty cool, though, you know, clanging and all that sort of stuff. But i got to say, there was nothing in it. And then all of a sudden, the Mando has his fight with all of them, including the guy that wants to jump the top rope and, and does all that. And that fight was far better. Yeah. It was like, you you sort of, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, it just, it didn't make any sense to have two. That should have been an exciting thing to watch those two Gamorreans going at it. It really should have been because that would have sucked you into the episode far more. I don't know. Yeah, the, I guess the weakest part of that whole thing is, right, you know, like uh, the, the all the guns pointed at his head, as in the Mandalorian's head. And you just know, oh, he's going to get out of this without even, not, not even like a dink you know, on his armor, not even a scratch. He's whistling things are going to go around and kill everybody. And it's like so unbelievably predictable. Now, admittedly, we saw this in the trailer, but still. And it was like, yeah, just get to the point of it. Okay, we want to find out what's going on. Now, the thing I found funny, right, is like he's trying to interrogate Gorg uh, Koresh about how to find other Mandalorians, right? And then you know, he says, go to Tatooine and yada, yada, yada. And I thought about this afterwards, and there's probably a reason for this, and some Star Wars nerds are going to have to dig into this. Why doesn't Din, Dejaran, just go back to Mandalore? You want Mandalorians, that's where they are. They're, that's their home planet. So the planet didn't get blown <laughs> up. It's still there. So you could always just like head back there or go to Concord Dawn or somewhere else. So it's kind of funny just to go to Tatooine because I'd have heard of a rumor of a Mandalorian being there. And I thought, yeah. And it just, of course, he just left all these Mandalorians on the other planet in the last season. So I suspect in his travels, that's where Bo Katan will come into the story. So that probably, you know, he's looking for Mandalorians and she's a Mandalorian. So that's probably how that'll work. Yeah, it, it seems like they are so mysterious. They're almost like the Jedi in, in a sense, you know, and the Sith, you know, it's like, oh, I've only heard rumors of a Mandalorian and I think he's on Tatooine. It doesn't make any sense. These are, are myths, legends, rumors that more than just the scum and villainy should know about um so we go back to tatooine that's probably deliberately in, in design you know it's the first episode we need something that everybody can relate to so we didn't just pick a planet at random we've gone to tatooine uh we catch up with peli uh moto which is great and i like the idea that she had the map and she actually pointed out moss Eisley and moss esper oh there we go links to the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy which i thought was kind of cool and once again the sand people make a huge presence as do their banthers and i gotta say the banthers they mm. look fantastic that was yeah. very very cool that was uh, the way the imagery was was uh, spot on. I think a lot of fans would have just loved it just for that. So, yeah. Yeah. I did like the interaction between um, him and the sand people uh, and the Banthers. They're just beautiful creatures, you know, and I know mm. they're elephants underneath, aren't they? Well, well the original in the original trilogy, they were, yes, but now they're probably yeah. all digitally done and, you know, mucked around with them. Oh, I don't know really. if they're digitally done. They look pretty, pretty, pretty real in the, the effects. But anyway, that's not... Yeah. Not the issue. They do look really, really cool. When he lands uh, and he sees, um, oh, what was her name again? Uh, Peli Moto. Peli Moto. Sorry, Peli Moto. We'll get that right eventually. Moto. New names. We've got to get used to new. They can't just call them like John and Charlie. They've got to call them something. Peli Moto. Yeah, yeah. And then the Pitroids. What yeah. a bunch of idiots they are. They have always bugged me, even from episode one. And they're just even more ridiculous. Now, did you think when you saw that R5 unit that that was the same R5 that the Jowers had? Well, as the old joke goes, he certainly didn't look very motivated. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it probably look. It probably was. You know, <laughs> it's one of those in jokes you just got to love. Yeah, because I saw that and I thought that's got to be or 
a reference would have been back from that. Um, so we get onto Moss Pelgo, okay, which is another little mossy place out in the middle of Tatooine. And it's good to see that the uh, filmmakers are now actually starting to reference things from Legends, which is kind of cool because Moss Pelgo uh, was originally first referenced in the Old Republic game Knights of the Eternal Throne, which is kind of groovy. So uh, uh, they're sort of digging stuff up from all over the place at the moment, which is kind of cool. And, um, and of course, Cop, that introduces Cop Vanth. Now, if you've never read the Aftermath books, which are classed as canon, you'd be going, who the hell's Cobb Vanth? Mm -hmm. And, of course, he gets brought into the story there. And, of course, he did actually have the Boba Fett armor, and he was actually the sheriff of a town, which I think they uh, renamed as Freetown. Uh, how he got the armor, there's been a few changes from what the books did, but you've got to kind of allow that for a TV series. Mm -hmm. Hell, even the Star Wars movies, even the George Lucas ones contradict each other, so you've got to be a little bit flexible with that. But it was good that he appeared the way he did. Wearing the Boba Fett armor is like, oh my god, the fans just went off their nut over that, even though he did look a bit skinny and and, and a well, bit puny in it. <laughs> I gotta say, when I saw when he turns around and says he's in Mandalorian armor, he turns up and I go, That's not that's not Fett himself. And that is some skinny, ranky little dude, and it shouldn't be too hard to take the armor off him. Seriously. Well, I could, he could have mentioned any other name, but the fact that he mentioned Cobb Vanth was a big thing and a lot of Star Wars fans went off their nut over that one, which I thought was actually kind of cool. Yeah, you're right, and he takes the helmet off and it's like, oh, my God, it's a completely different scenario. Um, the uh, But I did find, like, the man, like, Din, I've got to start calling him Din instead of the Mandalorian because it could be anybody, rolls up into is that, the town. Is that the sound that, a, is that the sound that makes when someone hits him in the helmet? Ding! Yeah, exactly right. Ro walks into the bar, right? And once again, the bar just needed some swinging doors and a piano player in the corner. <laughs> And I couldn't help but think, you know, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to swear here in front of all the Star Wars fans, but it was exactly like a Star Trek episode of Discovery last week where they also had a bar, and but they actually had swinging doors. So Star Wars, you're kind of letting the side down here a little bit. Two episodes of two different shows dealing with bars all at uh, like a week apart. It's like, what's the deal with that? Um, so you got the Weequay bartender, right? And I realised afterwards when you had all the townsfolk, he was the only alien there. I don't think there were any other aliens. Everybody else was a human. So he was clearly the outsider of the group. So yeah. I think it was quite uh, intriguing. So um, I, I think that what they did with that bar scene was they used the um, a bit of the cantina and just re reshot it yeah, a different way absolutely. because I was like, hang on a second. It looks almost identical. You couldn't yeah. have flipped the images around. You couldn't have done any of that sort of stuff. Instead, it's, you walk in there, the bar is here. You, it, yeah. Look, I understand yeah. the filmmaking side of things, but get a bit more interesting guys just every so well, often well did you like the idea that like in the pre in the prior story for Cobb, he said oh yeah i had the town the 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 rough dudes came in and like bullied everybody around and it took a hero to fix the problem you know i put the boba fett armor on and i'll blow the shit out of everything it's all well and good and i thought hang on that's from the star trek discovery episode from last week as well <laughs> everybody <laughs> it's all the same tropes it's all but everybody's copying everybody else so i agree with you it needs a little bit more of originality, what can I say? But uh, anyway, we, we move past all that. And we've got the whole thing with the Cray Dragon. And of course, you know, we've never really seen a Cray Dragon before. And then and like, they just remind me of the Spice Worms of Arrakis from Dune or even from Tremors. They're all under the ground doing their thing. And that was all really, really well done. And the whole thing with the Tuscan Raiders um, and the way they all sort of work. Because the whole story was clearly about how to get two opposing sides working together the humans and the raiders all oh, we hate each other you know they're always attacking each other oh, oh, they're oh, hang, on, hang, huh? hang on that sounds like a star trek episode that just aired oh it my does, god doesn't it, eh? oh it does oh my god you're exactly right so for those people who don't like hear me swearing the episode that aired that same night had exactly the same sort of thing so but it was good that they sort of like combined their efforts and uh attacked the uh crate dragon uh together and all that sequence was all you know really well done <laughs> I, I feel sorry for the poor guy that has to take the banter down the first time. And you go, uh, who's going to do this? Oh, Bob, you can take the banter down the first time. And he goes, all right, I'll take it down. It'll take the banter. It won't worry about me. Then it sees it coming. He goes, oh, crap. And he's running really hard. And then he gets eaten. And everyone goes, oh, there goes Bob. Who's next? And it's like, nope, not me. <laughs> that was a really, really funny scene. And I like how the banter's like just sitting there going, well, what's the deal? And of course, the, the heroes are going, ah, yeah, we're going to have to rethink this. And that then led into the bit where they actually, look, had the, the, the little bone set up of the Cray Dragon and the little stones. <laughs> and they say, oh, yeah, this is to scale. And it's like, I reckon the people who are writing this stuff are having a whale of a time. They're laughing their heads off. And it's like, is that actually that's what the scale? Who cares if it's the scale or not? But apparently it's the scale. I thought that was actually very, very funny. So, um, so the idea of that, you can use banthers to lure cray dragons out of their caves. Now, once again, this is referring back to a legend things because that was mentioned in Knights of the Old Republic. So there you go. We're getting into that. And speaking of cray dragons, the thing with the pearl being inside the body is also from the expanded universe as well. So there's a nice little nugget 
if you want, or a pearl that's been chucked into the story for the fans of that material. And you had something I think you wanted to mention about the, the pearl. Is that right, dude? Yeah, I didn't know about it because I don't read the expanded universe stuff. I'm not into mm-hmm. all that sort of side of things. But that was that was confusing for me because I had no idea what it was referencing to. And it wasn't like the egg uh, from season one mm-hmm. where he goes where he goes for the jowers, the egg for the jowers. You know, and then you see them and they they all eat it and they sound like minions at that point. Here you've got this pearl and you've got no reference to what it actually is. Yeah. You know, could it have been like a, a embryo for a new crate dragon or whatever the case was? Could it have been something else? Was it something it ate? Who knows? So it would have been a nice little reference to say, hey, look, they found the pearl, which is every crate dragon, which gives it its whatever yep. sort of thing. So. Yeah, it's an, as I said, it's a nugget. It's mainly a bit of fan service for people to go, oh my God, look at that, for everybody else to go. Yeah, what's the big deal? Is like, is that what they were chasing in the first place? I thought, I thought that was interesting. 20, 20 or 30 of those makes a hell of a pearl necklace, I tell you. That. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed it does. There you go. Um, uh, I thought it was interesting, like uh, the the speeder bikes, right? I mean, I did notice that um, Din's speeder bike, actually, when he pulled into the town, actually had a sound of a real motorcycle. So they're obviously taking the sound mm. of a real motorcycle engine. And some fans are theorizing that the uh, Cobbs... Um, speeder is actually the engine from anakin's pod racer because it's clearly a pod racing sort of yeah. thing and there's a bit of a connection there so some fans are joining dots that can't be joined but you know as you do so but it was kind of groovy that it was herping around in one of those i didn't know if, cool. i didn't know if it was anakin's pod racer but i definitely saw it was a pod racer yeah. engine of some sort you know and the fact he sits on the side not behind or anything yep. like that that was interesting he could have sat on top uh but yeah sitting on the side just makes it a little bit um um, not symmetrical in my in my opinion, but yep, it was that's a fair call too. And one of the things that I really did like, um, and we've discussed this on other shows like Star Talking and the podcast we had last year and all the rest of it is like what happened when the Empire fell. Now you mm. know, based on the movies, especially Return of the Jedi and the special edition, it was all wonderful. It was you know celebrate the love and the world's happy and fantastic. And but it's like well, what happened the very next day. And there's a school of thought to say, well, okay, it wasn't a very good time for a lot of people, you know, like the government effectively has just gone overnight and lawlessness can just come in out of nowhere. And they actually demonstrated that in the show where you got the mining dudes who just pop up on the same day, apparently, the things just blown up and in they walk. And I really like that they did that to say, okay, the government is gone, the empire's all pulled out, you know, the stormtroopers are gone or whatever else. And it's just like, it's a free-for-all. And all these gangs who have probably been sort of hiding in the background for all these years have now sort of got together, go, woohoo, yeah, beauty, the, 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 the government's left town, the police have buggered off, so we're just going to come in and take over. And I like the fact that they did that because it does actually emphasise that it wasn't good for everybody when the mm. empire fell. And I think that's very important, especially with Tatooine being in the outer rim. i got a question. What? So we know that, that uh, laser fire bounces off the Mando's armour but all of a sudden it bounces off Boba Fett's armor, which then leads to the question of, for those who aren't aware, how do you get the ding in the helmet? Very good point. There you you know, go. All of a sudden from this series, we've changed a bit of the rules of how the armor works. Now that then possibly means that the Mandalorian's armor, oh, sorry, Fett's armor is only maybe partially yeah. the material and maybe he didn't get it all done or I don't know, but it now changes the law of, of the material of the suit. Well, I mean, Django Fett's armour, which was all chromey, you could have argued was Beskar, and then I think mm. Boba Fett's armour came from Django's, and you're right, he's got the ding in the helmet, so maybe you're right, because you've got to remember, even our Mandalorian had to work to get his Beskar armour, mm. didn't just have it by default, so I think you can argue that, uh, yeah, it's not purely Beskar uh, for all these nerdy nerds out there who will know more about this than just about anybody else. Um but yeah, the ding in the helmet that was in like Return of the Jedi. So at least they've carried that through. And I did like the yeah. fact that it, he's got the armor on. It's like, and you get to see the rocket pack in action. The thing that uh, he shoots off, that was all very cool with the scan thing coming down and everything. That was all very, very groovy. But uh, yeah, so I can understand how he rolls into town wearing the armor and he blows up all the mining dudes. But then he keeps the armor on. And you go, by then, everybody knows who you are. So you don't really need it anymore. <laughs> but you know, whatever, it looks cool and it's all, it's all very groovy. But I thought it was well portrayed anyway. So, uh, but anyway, so getting back to our at the end, the big reveal. So, what, do you, what were your thoughts on that? I thought it was a waste. But at the same time, you could have done a lot more with it. He could have been in the town or been closer or done something else or been one of the whatevers. And he's just standing on the thing on the ridge with, you know, what looks like. Um, the outlaw Josie Wales sort of outfit without the hat. Um, 
and a couple of uh, Tuscan Raider weapons, and you go, that's just a waste. You could have done so much more. Look, I, I get the fact that there's bringing something forward to a story, but it was like he needed to be like seen in the episode in a couple of other places, I think, first, and have him not actually like have him sort of almost like he was going to get his armor back or something like that or understand, but it just, it was just a waste, I think. Yeah. It's um, um, obviously you've got a lot of people like really worked up. And then of course there's a counter argument. So, well, maybe if it's not Boba Fett at all, it could actually be just another clone. You know, we don't mm. really sort of know. Uh, and then you ask yourself, well, what's going to happen now? Is it the last time we sort of see the guy? And it's just like, what are the chances that he makes his appearance just as our Mandalorian has made his appearance um, yeah, you do sort of wonder because obviously our Mandalorian is going to go back to Moss Eisley, get in his ship and butt and nick off because he's got to, yeah, that's it. Tatooine's done and dusted now. And I'd be surprised if they actually come back to it. So maybe it was just like hanging hang like, hang like the carrot for the fans to go, there he is. You've finally seen Boba Fett. You've seen the armor. You've seen the character. Now shut up the lot of you. Right, you're done. Dusted. Let's which, move on. Which, which <laughs> does finish the argument of does he survive the Sarlacc pit because the yes. armor does. And as we remember, it throws out any droids because it doesn't like the taste of droids, which means that. Fett's armor was metallic yeah. enough that it didn't like it. Now, obviously, he might not have survived completely. You know, you might see he's got prosthetic leg or something like that later on. But the fact that he actually got spat out or survived or whatever the case is now finishes that argument for the last 30, however many years it is now. Yeah, and you watch the producers of Mandalorian will not actually, probably won't confirm or deny. I mean, I know it's on IMDb. But I wouldn't be surprised if they say, no, we're not actually going to confirm or deny if it is Boba Fett or not and let the fans just stew on it for a little bit longer. So, But uh, at least it's done, it's dusted, it's out of the way and uh, we can finally move on. So I thought, yeah, good on for doing it. But yeah, it was kind of did remind me a little bit of um, uh, A New Hope, the special edition where he turns to the camera and goes, oh my God, there he is, there's Boba Fett. And then we see him without a helmet. Now we see him with a helmet. Oh my God, it's all very exciting. So anyway, we've answered those questions. That's the most important thing. And what else have you got for us, MPS? I... I got to say, I love the end credits. I love how they put the pictures in that are animated, which could be like the storyboards, because you see sort of different elements here and there. Like you'll see how they perceive the concept art for it. And all of a sudden it's different. Like there's a picture in this one where the child is sitting there with one of those little skinless kangaroo type things. And you think to yourself, oh, that could be lunch for the kid, don't you Don't you reckon? Um, yes. But I love the the fact that they do those at the end of the show i think it's it's a beautiful sort of montage of pictures you know it doesn't tell you anything really but it's just a beautiful set of artwork all right so we've reached the end of the episode which means we've got to give it a rating in boba fed helmets that's what we're using for this particular show so mps give us a rating on the old uh marshall oh i gotta say it it floated a little bit but wasn't that fantastic for me two and a half helmets oh geez that's oh, hard work it's mate. like, a, Golly, it's like a dark saber to the heart isn't it far out oh i'll tell you what oh that's a moss pelgo sort of kicking the guts if ever there was one so uh, <laughs> there you go very good for myself i was uh, i realized the sh the quality of the show is very very high um the visuals are outstanding the world building is awesome it's it clearly the fan service to Star Wars fans is absolutely fantastic. And that's the reason why fans are really getting into it. I do wonder, though, if you're an outsider who's not into this whole thing of Cobb Vance and Boba Fett and whatever else, how a normal a normal person would perceive it. Uh, and I think they, 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 they'd enjoy the uh, adventure part of the Cray Dragon and the Trusting Raiders, but the rest of it, I'm not too sure. I myself said uh, three and a half uh, helmets. Um, I found overall... It was there was a lot of filler. Okay, there's a lot of stuff of just nothing mm. happening. You know, Banthers walking and dudes walking and you know, lots nice, beautiful establishing shots. There was no real character development whatsoever. It was just like, okay, here we go. Cobb Banth, this is a dude. Okay, done. He's had his little story, but everybody else, there was like nothing there whatsoever. Um, the whole thing with the crate was a lot of fun. It was really well done, and you know, could really really tap into it. But Overall, it was just the monster of the week story. Okay, it was yeah. that, that's all it was. You know, yeah, we, we've seen the cray dragon. It's all going tick boxes. You know, ticking boxes. You see Boba Fett tick. Okay, you've got to see cray dragon tick, and all the rest of it. So, uh, and I think it has a lot of entertainment vac uh, value, but overall, the substance uh, really wasn't there. And that's the reason why I marked it down to three and a half. Uh, and that's why I, mine was two and a half because you can't beat it visually. There's nothing wrong with it visually but there wasn't enough substance in the story. Yep. Yep. And that could have been a far more better story with far more um, danger elements to it in it. But they just, they played it safe, I think. 
Yeah, for the first episode, I think they had to. But I think for fans, ultimately, we're saying we need to get back to the core story. Let's get back on it. And maybe next week they will. They just, you're right, start off on a nice, easy sort of thing, get everybody sort of excited and juiced up, and then just move into the real story, which I think would be quite interesting. So there you go. Very good stuff. Well, that actually brings us to the end of the episode. The good, old, the good news is good old Mandalorian's back next week. So uh, there you go. With a bit of luck, maybe the episode won't be copying Star Trek Discovery, which is kind of seemed to be a common going theme at the moment. So uh, so sorry for all those fans out there who are like all the swear words. is like they can't handle it. So um, let's hope it uh, finds its uh, feet, goes its on, on, its, on its own path. And the child actually gets to do something besides just look cute, as it often does. So there you go. All right. So we're going to buzz off now. Leave you to it. And make sure you keep on warzing on. What else can you do? So there you go. All right. See you in a few days' time. Okay. Enjoy. See yeah. you.